Good Friday afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Melisinos, and I am so happy to be here with you again on this Friday afternoon, May 5th, I believe. Of course, our holiday yesterday, May the 4th. I know, a little bit tired, but not for us big old Star Wars nerds. So again, once again, thank you so much for joining me here Friday afternoons on Rewind, the retro game show. We look at games industry's past to understand how it shapes games industry's future. And again, we do this show every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. And on this episode of Rewind, I am thrilled to have two people that are leading this, this charge to make sure that we are preserving the history of the games industry for future generations doing it correctly and, and we're going to dig into the work that they do why uh, the video game history foundation was originally set up get into some of their background and a whole lot more so with let me go ahead and bring them right up to the stage and uh yeah let's go ahead and get this show kicked off and started and look who we have here we have Kelsey Lewin and Frank Cifaldi, co-directors of the Video Game History Foundation. Yes, let's go ahead and give a cheer for them showing up today. Thank you both so much for taking time out of your busy day to spend it with us on this Friday afternoon. So um, with that, let me go ahead and stop. Please, everybody, stop. Oh, good. See, that is what you want is an audience that can take those cues, you know, right there on stage. Now, hold on a minute. Let me go ahead and okay. unmute you so we can hear ah. we can hear your voices there. So too many buttons, too many mutes. But uh, now we're good and talking. So let me go ahead and uh, start by having you all introduce yourself. And since Kelsey, you're right there on the top of my screen. Um, why don't you tell us a bit about uh, about Kelsey Lewin. Hi, yeah, I'm Kelsey. Um, it's good to be on top. I am <laughs> <laughs> I'm the co-director of the Video Game nah, History nah, Foundation, nah, nah. Um, and I uh, also co-own a handful of retro game stores in the Seattle area called Pink Gorilla Games. Yep. Um, and I, that's that's most of it. That's most of what I do. The entirety of you is your work. Yes. <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. And you may also see. Kelsey's videos on YouTube and she goes into all this kind of retro game collecting, which is absolutely amazing. So thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you, Kelsey. And Frank. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Frank Cifaldi. I'm the other co-director of the Video Game History Foundation. Um, I'm sure we'll get into what that means soon, but we're, we're a nonprofit uh, that's here to preserve the history of games and make sure that if and when people want to tell our stories, they can, they have access to what they need. Um, but, you know, in general, uh, uh, I've been kind of a gaming historian for 20 something years um, and uh, figured out how to make it my job and, and thrilled to be here. Awesome. Awesome. We're thrilled to have both of you. So. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in. Let's get a, I want to dive in a little bit on your history, Frank, since, you know, you um this is game preservation is not something you just kind of happened upon this is something that you were actually driving well before the video game history foundation was was founded so maybe you could take us back a little bit and talk to us kind of about the early days of of collecting i mean collecting or, or preserving is more than just having you know a, a bunch of games that that you got over the years you threw away the boxes for and they kind of stuck on a shelf or in a cardboard box and in, in your, your garage somewhere or downloading you know a whole collection of games off the web and uh you know holding that's you know th th when we talk about preservation there's so many different ways to define it but again you were somebody uh that was working on earliest form of finding games kind of bringing them back and really with an eye towards preservation curation so talk to us a little bit about your early days sure of preservation um, you know um i i do think that video game collecting not only is a form of preservation but is how it starts um and it's how it started and so when i uh got interested in this in in the 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 very late 90s like 98 99 um my interest essentially was making sure that um, that games that were sold to people but were no longer in print were still um, accessible on the internet. Um, and 
you know, you're kind of asking about the earliest days and the earliest days were, was where we started with was, okay, what was actually published for the Nintendo Entertainment System? Like, you know, we, we didn't really have like, you know, that wasn't, you, you wouldn't like go on Nintendo.com and they have a full list. There's no, Wikipedia does not exist yet, you know? Right. Um, so a lot of that early preservation work was just like, okay, what was, what even was published? And, and of that list of published stuff, um, what has not been digitally preserved yet? What is still exclusively stuck on cartridges as opposed to uh, playable on, on emulators and stuff like that. And, and um, that's really where it started. And, and my career as it, as it were for, for, for preserving video game history was sort of filling in those cracks at first, um, mm -hmm. you know, and at, at first, first, it was like, literally like, okay, what was published in the United States and, and what, what is it out there? But as that, progressed um and i got more and more interested in in sort of the seedy underbellies of of these these, these console libraries it, i mean i i could tell you all kinds of stories but you know I, I was like wholesale importing weird games out of taiwan that weren't online yet i was um you know finding um games that actually were like made but never manufactured you know unreleased games and that, that's that kind of became my niche and what, and what i became known for and um and i don't know like yes, I could blast it, yes forward, it is but, and then 15 years later here i am yeah. yeah but i mean okay so i first got introduced 20 years later oh my god 20 uh, years there you go a exactly yeah you get a little bonus coin i found it i found a website called lost levels about unreleased games 20 years ago 20 years ago August. and this is what i was going to actually bring up but that's how i kind of first found uh, out about the work that you <laughs> were doing um with uh things like uh pen and teller smoke and mirror yeah Right, and yeah. so weren't weren't you willing to actually kind of found found the game, got money together to actually go ahead and acquire the rights and then release it? So without you, we actually wouldn't have access to things like. Oh, Desert I don't have Bus. the rights to release it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I did not acquire the rights. <laughs> <laughs> you just resur you just resurrected, got it, and put it out there. Yeah, um, yeah. So like I said, I kind of found a niche early on, which was games that never shipped, and and it's kind of what I became known for in, in my earliest days as, uh, doing this kind of work. And, yeah. and like I said, I started Lost Levels 2003. It was the first website, to my knowledge, um, that was about unreleased games. I'm really, really glad to see like Lost Media is a thing now. You know, there's like yeah. two wikis that are very active about Lost Media. There's like other video game specific ones even. Um, I'm not saying that to gloat, like I was first, I'm just glad that I was tapping into something that yeah. obviously we're all fascinated by. Yeah. Um, but yeah, through doing that, yeah, a lot of really interesting unreleased games ended up kind of, uh, going through my hands, like, like Penn and Teller Smoke and Mirrors, like you mentioned, which is, um, a really, really fascinating game for the Sega CD, yeah. uh, that was co-designed by Penn and Teller and it, and it, and it's like, it, it has the good and the bad of people who don't know anything about video games designing a video game. You know, right. the, the good in that, like, they have these crazy outsider ideas that a game developer would never come up with, like Desert Bus. Um, and then yes. the bad is that, like, the video game part is kind of weak. You know? Yeah, and also they decided to use every font in the 1001 font pack that they downloaded, <laughs> right, from yeah. some <laughs> shovelware thing, right? But, yeah, so, I mean, you got involved doing that. And I also, for those of you that are listening to this, go and look up a game called The Pile Wonder. And that's the other <laughs> big one that uh, Frank has a great story that we'll get into later about this game company <laughs> that released it. And sure. you were partially sure. responsible for them actually releasing a game that was only in the catalog but then they made it like yeah, apparently you had reached out to them enough that they were like crap yeah. i guess we need to make this game but we're gonna we're gonna dig into all of that and then you went we'll on that, to yeah. uh to get involved in things like uh, retronauts right one of the most popular retro game podcasts right that's been going on for years in fact here's a little secret for me um i like putting up christmas lights outside it when it's cold and in the dark and what i do is i go back and i listen to older retronauts podcast about systems when i was a kid and so putting up lights and kind of getting into the spirit and then listening to friends discuss the systems that I had when I was a kid, man, it's just this massive nostalgia, 
rush. So, uh, so yeah, so Frank, you know, at least, you know, you're listened to again, you know, while I'm out uh, decorating there. And then, of course, you went over to Digital Eclipse and Other Ocean and worked on um, several titles for them, right? And compilations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I was a journalist for a really, really long time yeah. um, in the games industry, both, um, you know, sort of business to business stuff. I, I edited what is now gamedeveloper.com. Um, and then uh, one up.com you, you kind of mentioned retro that was one of our, our podcasts mm-hmm. that I occasionally was on but um, yeah kind of you know I like to think figuring out how to talk about video game history was like my crash course in journalism and then I yeah. decided well why the heck not let's just do this as a job so I did that for a long time and then yeah I ended up um, doing sort of game design and production for a company um, now known as Digital Eclipse Mm -hmm. um, for a few years and and, uh, worked on a a few uh, retro game collections that were kind of done with an eye toward, you said this earlier, toward curation and and historical context. Um, So the ones that I was project lead on were... um, Mega Man Legacy Collection for Capcom mm-hmm. and which I have SNK, right up here. Are you pointing? I'm, I've, this, this entire case behind right me is swag yes. from that game because because <laughs> I, I figured like I'm never going to ship a physical game again, right? Like that was my that was what was going through my head. It's like I'm never going to have the bookcase of like my games because because at the time anyway, physical games weren't a thing anymore. Like we did and we right. didn't think they were coming back. So I was like, oh, this is my only chance. So I just got every piece of swag for that stupid game. Um, I bought my own game like seven times. It's so stupid. Um, but uh, called, That's yeah, called juicing the numbers, man. It, that's, you know. What's that? That's called juicing the numbers. You, you don't, that's right. You know, yeah, yeah. I added that. seven we, copies. We to have the... to remove seven from the tally because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to the like 1.5 million or whatever. <laughs> that's we, right. We, we sold for Capcom. You're welcome. But, but the great thing um, is that your eye towards curation and preservation really um, kind of helped to set the tone for the other products uh, and and type of compilations that the company would become known for. The very Thank first you. episode of Rewind, right? We had Mike Micah on and we talked about the Atari 50th, right? And so you can kind of see the echoes of that kind of thought process the company went through of not just putting ROMs in a box, but actually, uh, you know, being very respectful and building up, you know, the the layers of content and art and story and, and the journey that it took to bring those games to market. So Yeah, that product huge, is so cool yeah. for me because it's like, all of the things that I was like hoping to do in a product one day and never got to, it kind of felt like unfinished work to me. And then as soon as I saw, you know, when, when Atari was getting close and I messed with it, I was like, Oh, they, they nailed it. Like, yeah. yeah they, 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 I know, they, I no longer feel like this is unfinished business for me. You know, it's like, okay, yeah. they, they did well, better than I would have. I was even thinking. You well, know? look, anytime so, you yeah. invoke the name Atari, I always have to play this. Oh yes, yeah. That is a an actual button just on my regular soundboard as well. So I'm constantly bothering. Is people. that your ringtone? <laughs> oh yes, it should be. All right, thanks, Frank. Appreciate you. All right, and so Kelsey, um, let's talk about your background too. So I first got to know you through the work that you had done on YouTube and doing these incredible deep dives and collect. So why don't you share with our audience your background from retro gaming collecting? Um, Pink Gorilla, and then your involvement in preservation. Yeah, so um, I, let's see, I started collecting probably in like the early 2010s, um, in like, yeah, 2011, 2012, something along those lines, and um, just became really interested in that world. I had just gotten a job at a retro game store, uh, the same one I would later go on to own, and became really, really interested in the world and kind of a... um, I don't know, maybe a slightly over the top way. I wanted to go to all of the conventions and really like immerse myself in this world. Um, And I really, I became interested in trying to tell the stories behind some of these things that were maybe like collectible in a weird way, but like didn't seem to have done much in their actual time. Um, You know, the something like a a Packy and Marlon, like a, a game about diabetes on the Super Nintendo, like, did anyone actually play that? Like, why is this, why is this game worth $30 or whatever when no one actually likes it and, and no one played it? What's, what's the story behind what, what, it? Wasn't there a game, Captain Novelin? Yep, it's same right. company. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I think is really awesome. Yeah, yeah. Rea Systems was a, 
um, an interesting edutainment company. But, you know, when I started getting interested in this, I was just like, you know, um, no one is really telling these stories and it's becoming really, really, and it's really, really difficult to find information about uh, these things. Like if, if you look, even if you find contemporary uh, sources like a magazine or something like that, if there's coverage of them, it tends to be in like a making fun of it way because, you know, the editors at EGM or whatever were not excited about a game about diabetes. They weren't going to be engaging in with that like critically. They were just like, this is a bad platformer about diabetes. Who cares? Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's more leading into my involvement with the Video Game History Foundation. But um, before that even, I mean, just kind of immersing myself in the game collecting world and becoming a part of it. Um I just started doing some uh, some podcasts and some like YouTube uh, um, appearances uh, with a really big retro uh, video game YouTuber uh, called Metal Jesus Rocks, um, who's a good friend of mine now. But, uh, you know, at the time we were just kind of like, hey, like I, I need an expert about Pokemon to come talk about like nice. Pokemon game collecting and what's out there and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I started getting involved in that and just... Um, you know, being excited to share like the information that I had, that I had found and that I had immersed myself in with people. Um, but it quickly moved from that to wanting to tell, you know, not just, not just talk about the video game collecting scene, but talk about the stories um, behind these games, like why were they created and who worked on them? And, you know, what was the thought process behind them? And that's when I started my own YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, it, mostly just to do, you know, I was a, I was an amateur historian and I just wanted to kind of tell interesting stories because they were interesting to me. It was interesting that these products were made. And I knew that, you know, that something like a Packy and Marlon or like a, a Game Boy sewing machine or a Super Nintendo entertainment bike, like they weren't made to be funny anecdotes. They were made yeah. to be real serious products. So, um, yeah. And then in, in doing that, I mean, I put out, um, you know, a halfway decent amount of videos, um, doing a lot, a lot of research, a lot of deep dives into this stuff. Um, in doing that, I was just getting more and more frustrated. I was like, it is so difficult to find information about these things. I am, you know, I'm going to literal libraries. I am looking at, uh, you know, subscribing to newspapers.com and trolling through old, old newspaper archives. I am like trying to find physical magazines so I can look through them and see if there's any references. Cause right. Uh, it's getting better now, but at the time, the Internet Archive had some video game magazines, like a few, but not not what we have now. <laughs> right. um, and that was, yeah, that was around the time that uh, Frank was starting the Video Game History Foundation. And I was just like, oh, here we go. Here's here's someone who gets it. <laughs> here's someone who understands that, like, it's not... I'm not as afraid about, of a, uh, you know, Super Mario World disappearing from you know, our, our ability to play these games disappearing. Yeah. I've, I've seen ROM sets and stuff, you know, like I know about emulation. Um, but what I was concerned about was that there was nowhere to get information about these games and nowhere to yeah. learn, you know, <clears throat> how they came about and who worked on them and, you know, what were people talking about at the time um, and, and just no way to tell these stories. Yeah. No. And look, I think your, your, passion and storytelling comes through in those videos so when i get to know who you know who you are as a personality and doing those videos and then knew that you were connecting to frank to go ahead and come work i mean i couldn't have been happier right to see that happen because again it's not just about oh it's this game that I kind of grew up with that i remember it's no like there's a reason why these things exist and what i love about like the exercise bike and these sorts of things we hadn't seen this before and video games were still pretty new so nobody knew like whether it was going to work or not. So it was really trying to use this medium in other ways that nobody knew if it was going to work, but you had to go ahead and take those shots to kind of get where we are today. Right. So yeah. Awesome, and that's, awesome, I mean, that's awesome. my favorite intersection is, is video games and other uses. <laughs> you All know, right. like and, other and later, we're going to talk about one of those that I think is the, the most uh, interesting, at least <laughs> It is the the one that you would never expect to happen, and you managed to track down like every copy of the this thing for Wonder Swan. I think it's for right, uh, but we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in and have a conversation about the Video Game History Foundation. So let's talk GDC 2016, Frank. Okay, 
GDC 2016. Uh, you're kicking was that, something. Was that it or was it 2017? It was 2016 and you launched everything in 2017. Oh, okay. So did we right? talk about it in 2016? So, so 2016, <laughs> Frank, so at the yearly massive conference for game development, the game developer yeah. conference, um, here comes a very excitable Frank Cifaldi saying, I've got this idea. This is something that I want to do. You know, how do we kind of get started? So tell me, like, what led up to your deciding to put together the Video Game History Foundation? It's so funny because I do not remember this encounter at all, but I believe you. Oh, I do. <laughs> oh, I, I, and I'll tell you where it was. It was the okay. bottom escalators in South Hall. Was it like... Um... Like, it was, was I am 8 bit doing its thing down there and the, like a kind of the, like the, the, the photo booth bit, thing. The like photo the booth thing was right over there. John, right? Okay. Super, super yep. Yep. awesome friend of all, right? Over Coming the back. Guys. Yeah. All right. And then Little Frank pieces. was like, Frank was like, hey, which I should have also opened by saying that I sit on the board of a founding board member of Video Game History Foundation. So um, now that I have that out of the way, Frank was like, hey, I've got this idea. And we, yeah. we need to figure out how to get this going. T tell me like what led up to that moment then when you decided yeah. to go and start this. I mean, really all I've talked about so far in the show is, is my work sort of preserving like code. But uh, what mm -hmm. I haven't really discussed so much is essentially what Kelsey was saying, which is um, I've wanted to study and tell this industry's history for most of my life. And um you know, kind of echoing Kelsey again. It's like when when I wanted to do that, that I didn't have access to magazines or anything like that. Um, you know, the Nintendo Power was something I had as a kid, but no longer had. And um, so I, I spent a long time doing things like, you know, actually collecting magazines. I mean, I'll turn the camera around briefly, but, you know, we we have a really large collection of books and magazines at the foundation that started. Um, thanks everyone. Please, please hold your applause. Um, <clears throat> this started as my personal collection, which didn't start with like noble long-term preservation in mind. It was just like, I need to know this stuff. Cause like, I'm, I'm trying to, in the same way that we were trying to figure out like what games came out for a system. I was trying to figure out what games didn't come out. You know, like, and, and, and that's the only way we could have done that in that time. And, and it led to things like me finding the people who made them and going like, Hey, in this issue of this magazine or screenshots for this, did you work on that? Oh yeah, I did. Do you want it? You know, like, like that's how I started digging stuff up. Um, and in terms of the foundation starting and where that idea came from, like, I don't, the, the story I often tell about why video game preservation became my cause is that um, I was really inspired by Martin Scorsese's film foundation. And I, and I saw a little documentary. I, th I think it was on AMC when I was pretty young and they have this, that beautiful stat that most of us have heard and beautiful in that it's horrible, which is that 90% um, of American films made before 1929 no longer exist. Like we only have, a representation of 10% of what movies were um, anymore. The other nine out of 10 just are no longer in the world. Um, and that scared me and got me thinking, is anyone doing that for video games? Um, and so, you know, throughout the years, I, I, in addition to like finding unreleased games or whatever, you know, I was tracking people down and getting their stories. I was collecting, you know, paperwork and, and, and I was, you know, trying to fill in the gaps of our understanding of video games. Um, and the the problem, as I identified it, and, you know, not only as an historian myself, but as someone who hangs out with the other historians, because there's really not that many of us, um, I understood fundamentally that the problem with video game history isn't that we don't know how to play the games. We all know how to play the games. We all know where to find them. Um, but we don't understand where they came from. We don't understand who made them. We don't understand why they made them. We don't understand the decisions that went into them. We don't understand how they were sold to people necessarily. We don't understand what people thought about them in their time. And like that, if, if, if you read any history book about anything, that's the kind of stuff that they need, you know? Right. And, and so the foundation 
you know, I was doing this a lot on my own and, and it was a lot of like, Hey, you should talk to this guy, Frank. He's a history nerd. You know what I mean? Like, like, like that was kind of the extent of the conversation, but I felt like, this guy I know Frank was pretty weak you know and it's like I need something stronger than that if we're gonna really make a difference and so I started the foundation to just kind of put you know a nice logo and and, and, a, and a look to it and, and and a 501c3 charity status as opposed to this guy who has an apartment in Oakland you know um who just and- wants to fill it up with video game stuff so you could just sleep in a warehouse of video games. No, I, I never liked that. That's the thing. I was never into it. It was right. just mandatory because there was nowhere else to put it. Yeah. Um, and and so the foundation was started so that um, so that we could sort of uh, hate that I'm. This is almost a pun. So we could like level up video game preservation. You know, like um, don't make a sound. No, um, I don't deserve that, or I do. Uh, um. <laughs> yeah, all of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah, it was like it was important. Elevate. To me. That's the that's elevate. The word. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Elevate. Yeah. So it, I can embrace, elevate embrace the way that and we, extend the way we think about video games. Yeah, and get people thinking about it differently, and yeah. and 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 promote the idea that um, preserving things like game code doesn't have to be scary to game companies. You know, that's like right. like this is. This is something that other mediums have solved. There are film archives and no one goes, oh, gas. Yeah. You know, UCLA has the master film. They could make bootlegs. You know what I mean? But like the video yeah. game industry has that fear. And um, yeah, but I, long story short, I mean, that, that's where this all came from. Is just like, this needs to be bigger than me. This needs to outlive me. Yeah. Um, and, and like, I am not satisfied with the tools that are available to us as video game historians. Yeah. And so- the video game history foundation is not a solution to all of these problems. It's more of a, like, just push in the right direction. Like, let's get this, yeah. let's get this conversation started. Let's start doing yeah. this right. Yeah. And, what, what and, and obviously my pitch was great. Cause I got Kelsey now. There you, so. That's right. That's, that's right. You, yeah. <laughs> that's what I get a sound for. Was, <laughs> I, I made a Patreon made all the pitch. Children that's right. You made all the really children happy. happy. No, and, but look, I mean, honestly, this is, um, you know, one of the things that I realized in getting to know you, you know, and the, the work that you had done back when we were doing the art of video games was I felt very much the same way, you know, and one of the things mm-hmm. in the initial, you know, exhibition. That's you how we in, met, by the way, yeah. if, you, if you forgot, like, well, I remember that encounter. Th- yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and yes, I do. Um, but oh God, it's just so long ago. Um but one of the, but the last line of the you know the uh, initial statement right that's on the wall when you go in is um you know it may be it may even be art and the, the thing that i was always asked is you know why this why it's so important i said well i want people to see video games the way i see them it's not just a, it's not just this game it's everything yeah. about the experience of where you were in that moment what was going on in your life you know how are you tapping into this? Who were the people around you? Like, how did this thing come into being? So, you know, I had a very particular and narrower lens to, to look through than what you did. Your depth of knowledge, right, is something that uh, just really set this apart from, from other sort of uh, endeavors that we had seen, right, in space, including, you know, the art of video games, which was, you know, albeit a, a higher level kind of cursory view of let's not take this stuff for granted. Let's pay it the respect that it needs and, and dive, you know, deeper into understanding, you know, kind of what, what, what this medium is. And it feels like, you know, your perspective aligns very much with the way Kelsey views video games and tells the stories behind them. Right, Kels? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, that is genuinely what drew me to the foundation. I mean, I, Frank, I had seen your name around because, again, you were that guy, Frank, that if you're interested. I actually didn't stuff, know that. I, this is the yeah. first time I'm learning. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, okay. I, I was not intimately familiar with your work, <laughs> but I had definitely seen your name around as like someone in this sphere. Um, and uh, but but I wasn't like I didn't know that you were the person I should be like trying to um, collaborate with or whatever. I just yeah. happened to see the Video Game History Foundation pitch and be like, oh yeah, that's it. Like, that's what I'm missing right now. Like, I don't have access to these materials. Like, I am trying to tell the stories and there's 
no place I can go for help with that. Um, and you know, that to me, that quickly became like, rather than, uh, how can I use the foundation's resources for my own research? It just became, uh, how can I make the foundation? How can I help? How can I make the yeah. foundation better and stronger so that uh, future Kelsey's have an easier time of it? And I, I don't get to do as much research anymore as I'd like to, but that's <laughs> that's okay. I think you would say the same thing. I just want you to know when you said future Kelsey's, I just had like, I just pictured like sci-fi you with like antenna. I don't know. But, like, it's <laughs> needed to share that. They're going to be really good yeah. historians. I think the <laughs> antennas help a lot. They, oh, look, and here they come now. Oh, there's all the future guesses. They're all going <laughs> to be. They're still kids. They, kind of, they got time to grow exactly, up. Exactly. They do have time to grow up. All right. So now we have. Well, I, 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 I want to add to the story, which is that the reason Kelsey's here is because she didn't stop bugging me until <laughs> like, I actually accepted her help. Um, yeah. So. I, had, I had just, uh, I had recently uh, both taken over um, Pink Gorilla. Um, so I owned a couple of game stores at that point, yep. And then also. Uh, had recently graduated college uh, with a degree in communications and a minor in business. And um, I just, I'd taken a lot of like PR and marketing classes and that sort of thing. And I, I just kind of assumed, I'd finally figured out that like you could actually have a career in the video game industry. For some reason, it took me until I was like probably 18 or 19 for that to click with me that like that's a real industry and you can work in it. Um, so I just kind of assumed like that was my track. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all right with words. I'm all right with, you know, marketing concepts and that sort of thing. So I'll probably just go try to get a job in the game industry doing something like that. Um, but you know, I, I just started bugging Frank and was like, well, here I have, I have the following skill sets. I can, you know, I can give you a, a communication strategy. I can run your social media, something like that. And, uh, and Frank was like, that's very cute. I have no idea who you are. Uh <laughs> you, you didn't start off with, so I have a very particular set of skills. Yeah. And, see, that, uh, was, you know, that was where I went wrong. That, that's, um, where, that's where, you no, went. that's where you went. Right. I just had someone who was already volunteering to do PR who like, I knew from, from, uh, from my days as a journalist. And she yeah, but yes, yeah, like, okay, you know, I don't think, yeah. I don't I think saying, you were ever wrong for, uh, <laughs> Not immediately taking up a stranger on their own. Oh, I don't, I don't think no, that's no, wrong either. But, but, here's sure. what I'll, but here's what I'll also say. Also, at that time, Frank, you were also trying to figure out what Video Game History Foundation was going totally. to be, right? Yeah. And so you were in this. I'm still kind of, doing that. Right. Which, yeah, but we're going to talk about what you're doing uh, right now. But so to be fair, right, having some solidity in terms of understanding what was going to be needed and how it was going to be built, right, then uh, kind of lit the fire for Frank to you know, bring an awesome, awesome co-director on board and super thrilled to have you there. So, all right. So that is the backgrounds of Kelsey and Frank, why they think game preservation is awesome, how video game history got started. And we're going to go ahead and have them walk us through a bit of what the foundation is all about. So let's go ahead and jump over to this beautiful site here where I have the live website up. And isn't that great, kids? Yeah. Oh, there's some more applause or that's just fantastic. Chris, I'm so thrilled you're just pulling up the website because as soon as you started this intro, I was like, oh, I better start remembering what our like four <laughs> are. Yeah. <laughs> no, look, that is part of being a gracious host, right? Is to yeah. make sure that I have everything that you need to go ahead and get across the message that you need to get across. So um let's, let's start with this beautiful Corey Schmidt's logo. Mm -hmm. My God, Corey Schmidt is a talent. Yeah, he he Absolutely. Yeah. There's a, there's an air horn for Corey Schmidt. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the mission of, actually, I'm going to shut that music off so it doesn't distract us. Um, let's talk about the mission for uh, Video Game and History Foundation. So I can click on this mission button. Yeah, maybe, click on mission. Maybe we, we talk. That. So why don't, Kelsey, Frank, you talk to us a bit about what we are doing at VGHF. Yeah, so I mean, our our literal mission statement, as you can see here, is that we're a nonprofit dedicated to preserving, celebrating, and teaching the history of video games. But more practically, what that means is kind of what Frank mentioned earlier, which is just making sure that people have the tools that they need to be able to tell the stories of video game history. So um, that means, you know, that we have a physical archive in Emeryville, California, where we have a ton of materials from video game history. Um, it means that 
we are digitizing a ton of stuff. It means we're doing advocacy for trying to make game preservation easier across the board institutionally. Um, we are like, you know, knocking on doors, basically, like finding people who worked in the video game industry and trying to see, you know, what still exists because um, video game companies for a long time were not really, uh, there, there was no um, economic interest in preserving this stuff because there was no such thing as like a remaster or a remake or, you know, even a port to another system for the most part. Um, and so when they when they put out a game, they were just kind of done with it and, uh, you know, didn't didn't tend to keep a lot of the materials that went into creating it internally. Um, luckily, some of the people who worked on these games um, did keep some of those materials. And so that's I mean, that's where we've been getting a lot of things is just from people who either worked on the, you know, on the games themselves um, in the past or worked on like the publications that were covering video game, uh, the video game industry. So like magazines and that sort of thing. Frank, I don't uh, know if you have <laughs> additional stuff to, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. But... I mean, there, there's, there's so much, I mean, that, that's the core mission, right? Like, like when, when I sort of whittle it down, it, it's, it, it's something to the extent of we want to make sure that, storytellers have what they need to tell the story of video games um mm -hmm. and and everything we do is is sort of an offshoot of that um whether it's actually having those materials whether it's figuring out um how others can distribute those materials whether it's like you know we we find things and 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 if if they're if there's a better home in a museum than than in our archives like funneling yeah. that stuff uh advising um, game developers and what they can do with their material if, if they'd like it to be used this this it, it all just sort of comes uh, you know uh, coming up with processes for like scanning magazines and things like that yeah. um funding uh 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 some external preservation projects um like everything we do sort of always falls back to uh uh making sure that that those tools exist and that this information exists, um, which um, we love doing, but it also, you know, I think hurts our souls a little bit that we're not just doing the work and benefiting <laughs> anymore. We're you know, benefiting from the stuff. We're, 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 the, we're the people providing the stuff now. It, it, Someday it, we'll but, retire and get yeah, to like play with our I can't with wait to emails. read one of these magazines. It's going to be so cool. <laughs> but I mean, but, the other but, thing we do too is, um, you know, we mentioned education in that, yeah. uh, in that mission statement. And we do a fair amount of, I would say, like inspiring more of this yeah. kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that through, um, we do a pop-up museum uh, every year at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo to just right. kind of, you know, inspire people to think a little bit more, a little bit harder about video games and and kind of where they come from and stuff. And then uh, we also have a, a podcast called the Video Game History Hour that we do a couple times a month um, and a blog, which is probably where like the most really in-depth um, stuff comes from where we, yep. I mean we try to showcase like what you can do with the kinds of materials that we collect, what you can learn from them and what kind of stories you can tell. Um, hopefully to both inspire more people to do this kind of work and also to maybe like show the video game industry that is so scared of showing this stuff that it's, it's not so scary. It's actually exciting. People love it. Yeah. yeah some of the things you're scrolling through really speak to that. In, in yep. fact. And we're going to dig into a couple of those. And look, sure. you know, the reality is that you know, we look back and, and understand that our industry is really only 50 years old, pretty much like from a consumer awareness yeah. and understanding of what the games industry is. Right. Um, and so for many years, and you know this, both of you being preservationists and, and archivists as well, is... A lot of the times, you know, game companies didn't understand that what they were making really transcended it being more than, you know, of just a product, right? And as kids, we certainly didn't understand that, right? Ripping open an NES box, throwing the stuff away, who needs the manual kind of thing. Of course, now it's like, oh, I just wish I had nice, you know, manuals that came along with, with, with all of these games. So to be fair, you know, the industry really didn't understand the cultural significance that these games are going to have, you know, over a longer period of time. And it's been, I think, probably over the past, you know, 10, maybe 12, 15 years or so that that notion kind of started to make its way into 
you know, the, the, the owners and, and, and management uh, of these companies, but certainly from the community, right, as well. So, oh, yeah, I, I think the sort of like retro game fan community, like, proved out that there was a market for this yeah. kind of thing. And, and I think it, it's, it has woken the industry up, um, yeah. you know, the, the, and, and something we often talk about is like, we're now in a time where it's just kind of understood that if you have a hit, you're going to remaster it on the next generation of consoles. Uh, right. That was not true remotely until maybe like 10 years ago. Um, yeah. So before that, a lot of the stuff just got trashed. Yeah, actually, you know what's interesting that you say that about we're going to remaster for the newer consoles. We just saw a case where uh, the Hogwarts game, the version for the PS4 and the Xbox One just came out, right? After PS5, yeah. right? The Xbox One Series X and PC did, right? So living in that multi-generational world of having to support all these different products, right? That's one that actually went back in the other direction a little bit for something yeah, that a, was so big, time. right? Yeah. That is weird. <laughs> but yeah, so when you take a look at, you know, for folks that are watching, right? And you can go over to gamehistory.org and see this website for yourself. It's absolutely beautiful. A it's ton of really old library. There. Oh, There's, yeah, we, we need to do a little photo. bit of updating <laughs> on, we, the, we on do, the project we, page. We do. I have a video <laughs> that I they shot when I was out there with Frank and Fortune and have it ready for this episode, but we're not going to be able to get to it anyway in the amount of time that we have. But they have a research library when you know Frank was talking earlier about uh, it's not it's source code preservation, but not for everything, but it's for things that may have been lost to time or or were really important uh, and impactful for a specific genre or specific uh, type of game or, or console. As Kelly said, public education, right? Super important. And the work that they've done at retro gaming convention, things like to bring in the full NES catalog museum, right? And, uh, yeah. uh, and, and do that stuff. Just absolutely amazing. Their media assets archive, the process they put together to archive the collections of uh, magazines and ephemera that sit around the and game developers industry. as well, like like we're yeah. seeing in this photo. You know, this is just surviving material from yeah. from a game developer. Yeah, yeah. Um, recovery and restoration. We're going to talk about a couple of uh, some pretty interesting ones, and then the work that you've done in terms of digitizing and making copies and and replicating these assets. We just built a robot farm. Look at that thing. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a couple of bonus coins on that. That's pretty amazing. That is pretty amazing. And then advocacy, of course. I mean, the two of you have really become known um, in the broader games industry as advocates truly for preserving our history. And what's important to remember, and that, that's you, one of our volunteers. Do you recognize him? Yes, yes, uh, I do. And we're going to actually talk about <laughs> him. Well, okay. maybe you you can go ahead and talk about him here. Oh, that really quick. That's that, that's Howard Phillips. Um, formerly of, of Nintendo of America. Um, he's, he's on our sort of advisory board and, and he's someone who um, has, has been a champion of our cause and, and has gone out and sort of spoken about the needs of preservation. And, and, you know, it's coming from a place of like the industry was really good for him and he, and he yeah. kind of wants to give back. Um, and so, and no bow tie, yeah, no bow tie on here. No so bow tie. Know, that was that's... that was that was mostly his like Nintendo character. Yeah, uh, the but... Howard and Nestor days, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. His that's book a... just came out. Do you have this, Chris? I do not have that yet. You gotta get oh. it. You gotta it's get really, it. It's really, it's great. Running out. I'm I'm just thrilled with how like honest it is. It's really really nice. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I'm, and that's my fan. My, my apologies, I don't have that yet. Um, but now, as soon as we get off, I'll have to go to the fine website, Amazon.com. And go ahead. I apologize. I'm sorry. That nah, nah, was... nah, nah. Your life force is running out. Yeah, I, my, my, my apologies to you all for that one. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do that. But I want to talk about some of the the projects uh, that, you, that you've worked on. And they're going to be over here in the blog section of the site. And when... When Kelsey and Frank put together these blogs, it's not, um, it is not just, hey, let me talk about a couple of extra things. I mean, they go and dive deep into the projects that they are putting together and that they are bringing forward through Video Game History Foundation for other people to learn from, right? So I called out three big ones that I thought were amazing. Well, watching a Nintendo Power Reunion, that one was just, that one was awesome. Right. Featuring just Howard to, Phillips. There you featuring go. Featuring Howard yeah. Phillips. And what I was doing while watching that episode or watching that that event, 
Um, downstairs on the workbench in my basement, I was repairing a broken Virtual Boy uh, by disassembling it and then having to go ahead and re-solder those ribbon cables to the uh, to the sensors in there. So it was a double dose of Nintendo for me that day. Wow. I know, <laughs> right? Nerd. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, our Nintendo Power New and your uh, li new library director, Phil Salvador, who joined mm -hmm. the company. He's not so new anymore, right? It's, oh my gosh, it's, it's already been a year. That's for, that is wow, just almost crazy. A year, well, and a year and a half. half. Yeah. Year oh and a gosh. half. Oh my God. So we're going to talk about the people that are uh, that are involved here as well. But the big ones were the Aladdin source code. Um, that was the first one. I was like, how did you find this? Did I pass by that yet? No. Oh, that's pretty it's, far. It's pretty far back. back. Yeah. Yeah. So we only have that's five like pages early. in the blog. Yeah. So here oh, we, we are go. digging for treasure in Aladdin source code. So real quick thing, if you have a few more minutes, I do as well, because we only have about 15 minutes left. And I want to hit them. So let's go ahead and rapid fire through these. Tell us what this was. The sure. Digging for uh, this treasure is, uh, in source code. Dis Disney's Aladdin on Sega Genesis. Um, we were in, in our collection. We, we have the original source material, so like the actual code, the raw art, and stuff like that. And um, we mentioned earlier uh, this notion of a lot of the times when we educate with things like blog posts, it's to push the study of video game history in a way that we think uh, it should go. Um, and in this case, uh, we want to normalize the idea of digging through source material like this to learn how games were made. And so um, in this particular case, uh, Rich Whitehouse, one, one of our volunteer engineers, um, went through and figured out like, okay, what tools did they use? What was the art pipeline? Um, and, and what's really fun is like, okay, what things did they did not did they cut out of the game? So he kind of like rebuilt some deleted scenes and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, the, the, the result I think is, is like a better understanding of this game. So, you know, it, again, if you play this game, you, you're only going to get so much out of just playing it raw, but if you sort of dig in and understand um, all the decisions that were made and like how the level editor worked and stuff like that, I think you, you gain a much better uh, appreciation uh, for it in a way that's just impossible otherwise. You know, it's like, I don't know, I guess a film analogy would be like reading the original script, seeing the original storyboard, seeing some of the, the, the takes that didn't make it, like the deleted scenes on the DVD and like commentary about why they deleted that scene. Like you, you kind of understand better like the movie making process. Um, and, yeah. and that's something that we want to see more with video games. This is an example of that. Yeah. So yeah, that was a that was an enemy that was cut from the game. You know, it's not it's not like mind blowing or anything, but you know, this like it had unique behavior and and it's something that you're not going to find even like hacking into the retail game. It's just literally not in there. It's not built in there at all. You yeah. have to go back to the source to even find it. I but, think in some cases, literally in like folders called trash, you know, in the source code <laughs> repository. But I think what's really great about ex you know exposing this stuff is. We hear often, right, uh, from people who play video games, oh, why didn't they just add this? Or how difficult was it to go ahead and yeah. do that? And, you know, oh, they, you know, they, they should be better at doing X or Y, right? When you dissect these games, especially, you know, games of this era, the limited footprint that they had to go ahead and express these mm -hmm. incredible worlds. I mean, we're really, I mean, they were these incredibly narrow paths that they had to walk. And so the magic of these games is, not just the ability to play them and kind of look like it, but what the developers had to do, the techniques they had to invent, ways that they had to go ahead and make the system appear more powerful than it actually was. And well, kind of or just like ROM things. space, right? Like, you know, they, they might have cut this enemy because it's like, God, we, we can't afford the 30 kilobytes that, right. that, that it takes to like, because we'll, we'll have to like upgrade the ROM size and, and like lose, a, lose millions of dollars in the manufacturing process. That's right. You know, yeah. like, yeah, and that, that amount of space you're talking about, I mean, that's literally like just half the space of the icon for Chrome on your desktop. Right. Like, right. And, but in that in that 30K, they needed to add audio or a character or or different mechanics, right, in these incredibly limited and tight spaces. So I think this is one that, um, you know, when you all put this together, this is one that kind of uh, set the tone for the type of work that that yeah. uh, that video game history foundation was going to do. All right. Um, 
the next one, of course, another source code one. So Kelsey, maybe you can talk to us a bit about that as well. And that is the Monkey Island. Um, oh, that really should be Frank talking about that, but I'll, I'll set it up a little okay, bit. Okay, yeah. Another, so it's, I, I, it's I, will another... I will leave it to the both of you to decide how you want to cover this one, but let's go ahead. I want to hear Kelsey do it. Let's go. <laughs> sure. I mean, this was another um, you know source repository we were given access to, and uh, this is Frank's favorite game, which makes you know kind of digging through it and discovering it even more... Um, like when you when you already know a game inside and out, it makes it very easy to pick out the things that like maybe were cut or are interesting about it or, you know, were changed. Um, and so in doing this, I mean, Frank was able to come up with not only a lot of like cut content, cut rooms, um, that sort of thing, but he actually learned how to program in Scum so that he could re-implement some of this into the game. Um, and the you know i mean looking through all of this stuff is awesome but the best part of it was that we um actually got ron gilbert uh, the creator of secret of monkey island to do a live stream um kind of stroll through the source code with us um you gotta where... go toward the end because there's a huge uh intro there you go yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you know you guys together you know just with your combined understanding of this game um, we're able to really explore it to like depths that even the biggest super fans of Monkey Island had never seen before. Um, and you were able to even demonstrate like live code something into the game um, so that people could see and understand like how this engine worked, how, how the scum uh, engine worked and maybe why the game uh, ended up kind of, you know, with the humor it does. Yeah. I mean, something that, that you... Uh, were able to kind of demonstrate is like anytime someone had you know just a quick silly joke or whatever it was so easy to quickly script that in and get it running um mm -hmm. which is you know i mean secret of monkey island is obviously known for its sense of humor and i think that just just in showing how the scum engine worked um and mm -hmm. working through the source code i think it's like oh well that makes sense that's why that happened yeah, yeah. for me it's something that I had always seen in interviews with people like Ron was like, oh, our secret sauce was our scripting language and how easy it was to just iterate and throw a joke in there. And, and, you know, super fans like me always, you know, understood that by taking their word for it. Right. But, but being able to like actually learn it and, and, and show on video with Ron there sort of supervising and um, even kind of explaining some of the functions as I'm typing them that I didn't quite understand. Um, we were able to, demonstrate and, and make you really feel like oh that that's actually how easy it was to script this game and 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 it makes you sort of understand a lot of the humor of it because it does kind of feel like improv comedy like that that is what makes this game special um and and I, i'd like to think that people who who watch this could could sort of understand and see that um well, and listen, what I want to add here is, as you can see, I'm manipulating actually this slider on your website. So that way um, you can see how these art assets were, um, how the the Z plane was generated first, and then these other assets were overlaid. Yeah, into and, the scene. and and what what actually we're demonstrating. So Z plane would be like the the Depth. areas that the player could walk behind, which is these white objects. Right. But the reason that I spotlighted these so much is because. Uh, often the Z planes were earlier drafts of the final. So in this case, that bench on the left, you'd never see that in the game um, because it's it's just not there anymore. But because we have the source file, it's like, oh, look, the lost left bench. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's well, exactly. what's funny, too, is like during that stream, because because like Chris, scroll all the way to the left, if you don't mind. Um, so like this is the image that like if you rip the assets out of the retail game, this is what you see. So we actually had a request in chat during the stream like, I want to know, does the source code have like what's missing in that purple part? And I was like, we got you, buddy. There you <laughs> are. There you are. You, you did it. You, you did it. You did it. <laughs> but, but again, you know, when you talk about uh, having a resource to educate uh, not yeah. just the industry, um, but also bring in the personalities, the people that created these games, and then educate us in terms of the process, right? It gives you just a completely different appreciation when you go back in and you you play through through those games. And to be clear, 
Secret of Monkey Island was one of the five games that I got to choose for Art of Video Games that just mm-hmm. without questions, like these are the five that I'm putting in here. The museum didn't get to weigh in, public didn't weigh in, and it was because this was the game, the very first game that was truly funny to play, right? Really set the standard by which, you know, most point and click adventures followed, right? Where it was incredible. At least in my life, yeah, this is when I realized like, oh, games can be funny. They can have characters I care about. You know, they can be like, they could, they can replicate social experience and uh, experiences and not just like, you know, jumping around and hurting things, you know, like, like, like it's a game about actually like talking to people and learning their quirks. And like, there were, there was other stuff before that, but for me, that was like, my awakening game you know it's like oh there's this isn't just nintendo stuff there's more to this yeah no absolutely all right kelsey real quick is there anyone in here in particular that you liked more than the others like what is the one that stands out for you that you were directly Ooh, that's at? a tough one um i mean I, I think that you know both of those were source code related and i think we've also done some really good kind of like uh, dives into people like the Nintendo Power reunion was a uh, was one that was a lot of fun to just kind of get early stories from uh, the people who who worked on that very early iteration of the magazine um, and to have them all in one place for the first time in a very long time. Uh, so it was it was really cool. We learned we learned a lot of really interesting things just about like what first of all what you know why it was made and you know what the culture was like there and what went into making it but then also just some fun little tidbits like that gail tilden named uh, legend of zelda link to the past like that was just brand new information that she just kind of set off the cuff and we were like oh okay well <laughs> or or i mean we we knew this going into it but uh leslie was the voice of princess peach in mario 64 and like i I don't know what I expected, but I asked, like, could you do the voice? And she just like read the entire thing, like pitch perfect. It was, it was, it was... <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so Dear <good>. Mario. <laughs> <laughs> so all right. So, so definitely a lot of really good information in there for anyone who um, you know, oh, if, yeah. if you ever read Nintendo Power or you just have an interest in like Nintendo mm-hmm. of America internally, I think it's a it's an awesome conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so um, tell me real quickly about your physical, uh, uh, you know, preservation space, right? The, your physical office there. So you want to talk a bit about kind of where that's located, what you kind of house in there? Yeah, um, so we have a physical space in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, um, essentially kind of on the border of Berkeley and Oakland. Um, and what we house here, oh, there it is actually, um, That 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 is our research library um mostly what we do here is i like to say we 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 process material as it comes in so like we are trying to build complete sets of magazines that uh primarily cover video and computer games um but in addition to that what else we house here uh is a combination of um like game development material you know we have a lot of like raw art on paper that was scanned in for making classic games, including Disney's Aladdin, which we talked about earlier. Um, We have uh, a lot of the material that was sent to the media back in the day, which um, doesn't sound terribly exciting, but for historians is the gold. You know, when we get to read, you know, the actual, uh, oh, that's a nice photo of uh, Kevin Curran from from General Computer, one of the co-creators of Miss Mm -hmm. Pac-Man. appreciating our Miss Pac-Man exhibit at Portland Retro last year. Um, I actually had him point at a light bright in the background because he came up with the idea to prototype sprites on a light bright. Um, I so did not know that. Like that, that photo is a seal of approval. They're like, yep, that's how we did it. Um, we got a, a period appropriate light bright, the you know, the one from the year that they, that they would have been using. <laughs> one that you would burn yourself on. Right, yeah. because you have yes. a light bulb in it. Yes, yeah, yeah. This the is best. this is the only time in anything the foundation has ever done that we allowed an actual like UV bulb near anything, <laughs> just temporarily, because <laughs> UV like fades paper. Terrible. Then, that's right. That's just right. Just one weekend only, and that's it. We turn it off at night. Um, and now you have but, a nice uh, Miss Pac-Man glow on like all those materials that were on. It's like, oh, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> um, nah, 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 nah. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's mostly what we house here is 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 um, mostly like paper and archival stuff. Um, a lot of those things that don't need to be like handled physically that are, you know, for example, like 
uh, data that's on a CD-ROM or something. We we mm -hmm. kind of just kind of digitize that and house it elsewhere because uh, why take up the space? But mostly what's here is the kinds of things that people might actually need to get their hands on. So paper press material and um, screenshots on film and and, and and things like that. Uh, and then of course the books awesome. and magazines, um, which were we're so dang close on having full runs of most of the U.S. magazines at this point. And much like, you know, what I was talking about sort of at the top of the show, just figuring out like what games were even published. Like we're figuring yeah. out what magazines were even published at this point, you know, because yeah. it's just not like people have attempted to document it, but it's just, there's no canonical information of, of how many issues of game players, PC entertainment there were. I think we right. figured it out. So I know that we're at the top of the hour here, but if I can just keep you all on for a few more minutes and Frank, yeah. really, really quickly, there was a, a, um, a publication that was done by, I think it was two women in, uh, yeah. in California that would go through and basically they released like the launch date for, for games in the U S that apparently like the publishers didn't even know. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. So there was a, there was a newsletter started in 1982 um, from two sisters in LA. They, they ran a mail order video game business on the side. Like that was their side hustle. But by day, one of them was actually a record exec at Warner Brothers. Um, so they had this mail order business. And they started a newsletter, um, monthly newsletter to sort of like go out to their customers um, right. that you know it wasn't just like to order games. It was like, reviews of stuff that had come out like previews of things and and um what what made it really well there's two things that made it unique first of all they ran a mail order business so they needed to know when stuff was coming right. um so every month before they went to print they just called every publisher and and got updated like release dates for when things were coming so the back of each issue is every game that they knew about that was coming with the release date that that they knew uh, that, that that they were being told. Um, so literally, and when I say date back then, it's like month. It's not exact day. We we, we weren't in those times yet. Um, but literally, our understanding of when any game came out in the '80s is from this publication. Mm -hmm. And when I say this publication, I mean our actual physical copy of this publication because. This thing is so rare that it's like never for sale. And what we have is actually the bound volume that the editors kept and that we scanned. <laughs> so like, that's how fragile this information is. It's like, right. you know, the release dates for like Atari 2600 games are only in this bound volume because every other copy of this newsletter, because it was a disposable thing, got disposed of. Yeah. And, and like, th that's how fragile it is. But the other thing that made it unique, Chris, is that... Um, this was the only publication that continued talking about console video games mm. um, after the uh, uh, what we think of as the the video game industry crash, right? So when um, the American video game industry kind of, for lack of a better term, dies around 1984, um, the video game magazines go with it. Right. You don't see video game magazines again until 1988. So there's sort of this like four year dark period. Uh, this newsletter, Computer Entertainer, kept going through that period. And so the, the, the easy example I give to uh, why that is remarkable is uh, the only contemporary review of Super Mario Brothers that we know of is in this publication. Um, like really? that, Yeah, like the only contemporary review of The Legend of Zelda, uh, at least, you know, in the U.S., in English, um, is in this publication and only in this publication and only in this physical copy that we have that is scanned on, it's on, it's on the internet archive. But um, that is probably my favorite thing here. Just the, the density of lost information in yeah. one hardbound volume is just remarkable. Yeah, And look, and the fact again that you're saving it so we can paint as complete a picture as possible yeah. while most of the people who not only founded the industry but continue to build these things are with us, right? So getting that information now to make sure that it's accurate is a luxury that no other form of art has right at their disposal. And so the fact that you're able to yeah. unearth these things, have it be part of that game industry continuum is just, is just absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. All right. So, um, 
I know we're over time, so what I do want to uh, make sure we, we show people, of course, is that you have your podcast, Kelsey. You had mentioned that before. And um, so this is being done on a regular basis. Make sure you go ahead and head on over to GameHistory.org and check out the uh, the podcast at the Legend of Zelda cartoon. I was literally watching that yesterday. I had uh, Super Mario Brothers what Super Show. What is wrong with you, dude? I had, I had it on loop, kind of in the background. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, I had, oh, and I don't have the, the audio on this board, but I do have the, well, excuse me, uh, audio clip that, that I use for internal meetings over here at AWS. That was a fun episode, actually. Um, yeah. you, should, you should listen to it. Awesome. Awesome. So Nicole, Nicole interviewed like so many people who worked on it and, and it's like, it's, it's more interesting than it should be the make uh-huh. because it, it, it was just a work for hire. You know, they just made a few episodes of a cartoon and then they made another cartoon right after, but it's like, people actually do have weird memories. About wait, wait, wait what was that? Well, excuse me. There you go. There it is. <laughs> At the ready for you. Uh-huh. <laughs> so definitely go and check out the podcast. Um, really, really awesome stuff in here and stuff that I'm learning uh, as is evident by this conversation here right now. And then also make sure you head on over to the shop because they got merch um, and uh, from Video Game History Foundation hats and pins and shirts and all of the kinds of things. But we also have this one here. So Kelsey, do you want to explain what this mystery box is here? Yes, this is we we love this so much. So basically, um, you can support the Video Game History Foundation in more ways than one by subscribing to a mystery uh, vintage video game magazine. And you can either you can get just a total random one, um, or you can get a, you know, 80s, 90s one or a 2000s one. Those are the, the two kind of separate categories there. What we do with this is um, these are magazines that are deaccessioned from our archive. They are, uh, you know, duplicates. They might be something that's in just slightly worse condition than the one that we have on our shelves. Um, and they have already been scanned and are on the Internet. So we have through this program, as people donate magazines to us, um, we they kind of go through a little a little preservation machine. First, we check our shelves. We see if we've got a nice copy on the shelves. Then we check to see if it's been scanned, and if it has not yet been scanned, then we scan it. And then if it already if it meets all those criteria, then it goes into a box, and and you can get it delivered to your door uh, monthly, just like you uh, used to get video game magazines delivered to you uh, in the old days. <sighs> and so all of this funds directly the preservation of video game magazines. Yes. Um. So it, it has absolutely gotten new things on our shelves for sure. But what I'm what blows my mind is that um. We have scanned through this process and through the funding and being able to pay scanners to do the work. Uh, we have scanned over 1,200 unique magazines that weren't online yet uh, because mm-hmm. of this program. Yeah. Uh, and there's 200 more. 1,200. The there's so it's going to be like 1,400. Uh, pretty soon. Um, that's a lot of content. <laughs> that's a lot of work, and I've seen yeah. what it takes to scan those things there. And speaking well, luckily of... we have a vendor, so like I, it's just in San Jose, so I just drive by the car load and drop them off, and and uh, and pay him money, and then he gives me a Dropbox link like a month later. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's, well, and we had a question in the chat here too. Is there any advice sure. you, you would want to recommend to those at home who have documentation collections, like safe safe storage, do's and don'ts? Do you have any advice to give? One of our viewers here. Any One. kind of materials unique, you know what I mean? So, it, it, but, um, you know, like, let's assume you're someone who is maybe in the industry, like, uh, general advice. Oh, I have a good one. Um, CDR and DVDR is not a permanent media. Like if you have data that is on, that is burned on a disc, uh, you need to get it off of there in somewhere more permanent. Like yeah, even just like an SD card or something, which are way, 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 way bigger than those discs anyway. Well, storage capacity wise. But um, I, I don't know exactly where it is right now, but I have a stack of like scary horror story discs that I like to scare people with because uh, the lamination on a disc does just start coming off sometimes um and and it is like it it is irrecoverable at that point and so if you have one of a kind data burned on the disc get it off i think that's my easiest quickest piece of advice for for digital preservation yep yeah i mean i think redundancy in general is Mm -hmm. always a very very good idea um and you know just kind of the, the general best practices are like 
a, a cool place, a dry place. You know, if you if you live in Florida or Hawaii, you should probably um, try to figure out how get to get a dehumidifier. Yeah, I mean, either not keep those in Florida or Hawaii, or, or really, you know, try to clamp down on the humidity and the and the heat there. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of just sort of best general best practices for um, archival stuff, but you know, you can you can go a long way with a cool, dry place and maybe an acid free box. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, so before we let you get back to the rest of your Friday afternoon. Um, Real quickly, let's go ahead and call out the team here. So we have Frank and Kelsey. And then do you just want to walk us through the other members of your team? Who's here on it? Should we flip a coin? Am I sure, yeah, it? sure. So uh -huh. um, so there's, there's three full-time members of the team. That's me, Frank, and <laughs> Phil, who is our library director. Um, he is an awesome case that came from both uh, academia and like, you know, literal libraries and from the game preservation world. So he's kind of a perfect fit here. Um, Travis Brown is our director of technology here. Um, every, no everyone longer a Twitch. Through... Sorry, Travis. We got to oh, update yeah. the bio. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yep. past, past Phil, everyone is, uh, you know, just kind of on a volunteer basis, but Travis does a lot of our technology. Um, Rich does a lot of our like, uh digital archaeology and conservation yeah. so he's the one who's doing most of the um hardcore technical work inside of like source code and, and rebuilding uh games when it's when it's not obvious how to uh, rebuild them or make things viewable um robin is our fantastic uh like she does a lot of stuff but she she mostly um is our uh, producer for our podcast mm -hmm. and and helps out a lot with with that and making sure that that happens at all times. And then, and then Amanda, uh, Frank's wife is the amazing, uh, creator of our website, um, among other things, but, uh, has, all things front see. end. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's <laughs> the best way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And is also part of the two person team that is cathode contraption which you need to start back up frank you need to start the twitch that channel that's been dormant for like six years you yeah. need to st i used to love watching you get you both of you play Aww. so then we have uh the board oh, members here. there yep. so yes as i mentioned i sit on the board there but we also have some just stellar folks uh from the industry as well yeah, yeah. and then uh so, oh yeah, so Steve, uh, Steve, Steve's at Discord. He's he's been he's he comes from the collector community. Simon, uh, I worked with for years at um, like the Game Developers Conference, for example. Yeah. Um, and wow, that oh wait, no, no, that one's up to date. Uh, Mike, Mike has been on your show. Uh, Chris Melsinos has also been on your show. Yeah, so that guy's terrible. Uh, terrible, <laughs> yeah. terrible guest. Just you know, prima donna. And then of course we have you have some industry advisors as well. Yep, we talked about Howard. Uh, Chris is a friend of all of ours, I think, uh, who's uh, at, at Xbox, uh, who's just really into this history stuff as well. And he's been a really good sort of ally, especially yeah. just within, you know, sort of navigating the the, 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 the Microsoft uh, forest. He's been awesome. And then Andy McNamara um, is at EA now, but we we met him as the editor-in-chief of Game Informer. And he's uh, he's someone else who's just like, Look, I love this. How do I help? And yep. it's like, well, be on our board. Yeah. Awesome. He's got the longest uh tenure, I think, like of a of yeah. a video game journalist at one outlet. I think it will literally never be beat. Um <laughs> unless Andrew Reiner beat it technically by Ooh. I think that yeah. I think it might be close. Um yeah. This now, they were both this, a game informer. No, like this, at the this, same time, basically. Now, this <laughs> replay magazine count. Because I was gonna I think say he's been there. Ooh. Yeah. This sounds like the perfect type of question that the folks at the video game history foundation should be able to answer uh succinctly and with clarity right the official so that's what you need to do now now you need to have the official list of people that have been doing this stuff the longest so anyway so this okay. is a walk through the video game history foundation website the projects that they're working on the team uh their incredible blog where they go into incredible detail about uh game resurrection preservation discovery uh and collection their podcast of course and of course the shop remember it, the video game history foundation is a non-profit it's a 501c3 make sure that you donate they have a patreon as well so you can go ahead and sign up for that um and the the more that you give the more uh, resources that frank kelsey and the rest of the team will have to be able to go ahead and preserve 
our industry's history for generations to come. So thank you both very much for all of that work that you do. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump into the, our kind of closing here. So what I wanted to ask the both of you, um, you know, what can we kind of expect from uh, video game history foundation going forward is there a project that you're working on right now is there some sort of big event where can we see and and find about new work that uh, that you're doing well i mean the best way to keep tabs on us is uh gamehistory.org or um twitter uh at least for now uh, game history org um in terms of upcoming projects like i just want to blast through these real quick without you know giving away the magician's secrets right but um we're uh, we're working on some copyright reform. We're we're, we're fighting lawyers. Uh, to uh, that, that that's <laughs> still number one. It's I like, know, I know, but I'm yeah. gonna hit all of the beats. <laughs> um, uh, the thing that I am working on right now that I'm really excited about. Uh, oh, I've I've mentioned this a little bit. I don't have to. It don't have to be too vague. Is uh, uncovering uh, some some lost worlds from Sonic the Hedgehog two. So I'm pretty happy about that. Very um, good. Phil is working on the definitive catalog of video game magazines, and we're building a product for people to be able to uh, research digitally, um, remotely. What am I missing, Kelsey? Well, I, I think to go a little bit further on that one is that, yeah, our, our digital archive product is um, is That's well on its way. Time. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It, it is the big thing. It's in the works, and uh, we're excited to be able to um, start sharing that. I'm Hopefully. excited to hear about that. Chris, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but software is hard. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, isn't chat GPT just going to make so you just type in whatever game you want and then it just spits out? I thought that's what all of that was supposed to do. And I'll tell you what service is hosting our stuff. It's AWS. Oh, oh my, my God. goodness. You're kidding me. Wow, that's just Can fantastic. You get us a we are so happy. Oh my goodness. Are these sounds just flooding the channel right now? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So yes, it is being hosted on AWS and thank you for being an AWS customer. And of course, we will uh, go and figure out how we can best help the Video Game History Foundation fulfill their mission, delivering this stuff safely, reliably to anybody that needs access to it in the world. Oh, that was so vague, that is we'll our job here at AWS. <laughs> and we are happy to continue providing you excellent service, Frank and Kelsey. Thanks, so, Chris. All right. So uh, <laughs> let me ask you real quick before you go, what are you playing? What's the one, two big games right now that you're that you're currently playing? Oh, I'm not well, playing I'm, anything. There oh, really? Go. I'm I'm actually playing like three things right now, which is okay. which is weird for me. Um, I'm playing the new Xenoblade Chronicles 3 DLC, which is mm. fantastic. Uh, might be my game of the year, even though it's DLC. Um, I'm playing Octopath Traveler 2, which is also very good. And then I started playing a, a cute little indie game called Cassette Beasts, which is like a it's kind of like a Pokemon game, but um, a lot more interesting. Very cool. Cassette Beast. All right. I'll have to go ahead and look that one up. Frank, you're not playing anything? You it, don't it's have so time hard when people ask play. this question because I like, think back and I'm like, uh, last night I played the first Dead Rising a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there it's you not, go. It's not a currently playing so much. It, it doesn't like, need to be a currently like? playing. It is right. a playing. It is yeah, a playing. Yeah, so poked at Dead Rising a little bit. Might go back to it. Um, watched my wife, Amanda, just really want to play Donkey Kong Country last night. So hook that up. Um, well, you didn't do co-op? Um, well, the setup we have right now is one controller. So, ah, okay. Um, we, we usually do controller passing. I just, I don't know. I didn't feel like it. And then they but, just fought over you know, it. It was her need, not mine. You know, like I'm not, I'm not going to impede fair, on the fair, need. Fair. Yeah. Um, Very good. Before, the last like recent-ish game that I played was, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it. The, 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 the dog that paints. Uh, you know what Chickory. I'm talking about. Okami? Chicory. Oh, oh, Chicory. I'm sorry, see, Chicory I went, I went awesome. right to Okami. No, 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 no. That painting. is another oh, yeah. dog that paints. That it's is true. another dog that paints. Yeah. <laughs> Chick Chicory. Chicory is, Chicory is uh, a really, really sweet uh, uh, combatless Zelda, which um, oh. is something I'm always looking for. Um, that is I awesome. like I like exploration games where you're not uh, hurt and stuff. You're, yeah. you're, the, the friction is something else. So. Game developers, please make more of those. Awesome. 
Awesome. All right, so I want to go ahead and thank Kelsey and Frank for joining us on this episode of Rewind. Thank you for all the incredible work that you continue to do at the Video Game History Foundation. It is super important, and uh, your organization is unlike any other that we see in preservation. So thank you both again for the incredible work that you do. I'm so happy thanks, to Chris. be part of it in some small way. And uh, yeah, thanks, gang, for uh, joining us this afternoon. All right, see you at the next board meeting. Yes, we'll see you at the next board <laughs> meeting for sure, for sure. All right. And that brings us to the end of another episode of Rewind. Remember, you can go ahead and catch us here on the uh, on our Twitch channel every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern, where we'll be digging into Games Industries past to understand Games Industries future. Um, of course, if you are a game developer from small indies all the way to AAA uh, game developers, make sure you head on over to aws.amazon.com forward slash game tech to find out more about the solutions and technologies that we provide to game developers that allow them to create games and deliver them uh, you know, across the planet reliably, securely, and cost effectively. So again, more information for you at aws.amazon.com forward slash game tech. And of course, thank you to Waterflame for the use of his music here on Rewind and all the other shows that I do here on our Twitch channel. And you can check out Waterflame's entire catalog of music at on his YouTube channel at Waterflame Music. And of course, as I always end each episode of Rewind with a shout out to my good friends over at the Video Game History Foundation, who, guess what? We're just on this episode. And make sure you head on over to GameHistory.org to check out the incredible work that they're doing to preserve our industry for future generations. And again, that brings us to the end of this episode of Rewind. Thank you so much for spending your Friday afternoon with me. Have a wonderful rest of your day, an amazing weekend, and we'll see you on the next episode of Rewind. Thank you.